The Purdue University College of Agriculture has a long history of impact in research, education, and cooperative extension to improve agriculture and the role of agriculture in our society. One of the ways that we continue to do that is in this realm of digital agriculture. It's the fusing of our physical and social worlds to make improved data-driven decisions and actions. So you'll see a website up there in the corner. We encourage you to visit that, purdue.ag slash digag. I am Dennis Buckmaster, a professor of agricultural and biological engineering, and I also serve our dean and our associate deans as a Dean's Fellow for Digital Agriculture to coordinate activities in the college, at the university, and through to external stakeholders regarding data-driven, technology-intensive agriculture. One of the projects that we have is the Wabash Heartland Innovation Network. The WIN project is not exclusively a Purdue project. It is a partnership with WIN, the organization, the community foundations in a 10-county region of West Central Indiana, of course, Purdue, as well as Ivy Tech Community College, and many partner organizations, farms, manufacturing firms, etc. The focus of the WIND project is to increase the role of advanced technology in agriculture and manufacturing. In this series of brief presentations, you're going to learn of how the wind funds are being used to advance the technology in agriculture. So whether this particular video covers the capturing, the clustering, the collecting, or the computing, uh, you will have to wait to see. Uh, but in each of these cases, we are moving forward the technology in agriculture through digital means. Hello. Uh, my name is Jason Ackerson. I'm a soil scientist in the Department of Agronomy at Purdue University. Today I'll be introducing um, our wind-funded uh, research and extension project uh, oriented at using digital soil mapping to support precision agriculture. Uh, I mean, this project sort of focuses on two main aspects, um, research in sort of the fundamental science of, of making good soil maps and some extension work on how to translate those technical skills um, to producers and uh, clientele and ag precision ag practitioners in the wind region. Precision agriculture, specifically variable rate application of inputs vis-a-vis -vis fertilizer or lime um, and GPS guided machines have promised to reduce inputs on the farm and increase the efficiency of those inputs. And this has a whole host of potential agronomic, economic, and environmental benefits, um, including increased yield or decreased yield variability, increased return on investment for on-farm inputs, and decreased negative environmental consequences due to over-application of fertilizers or inefficient use of on-farm inputs. But one of the sort of great unanswered questions over the last two decades in precision agriculture is really, has this technology delivered on those promised benefits, um, and if not, why? So one of the goals of my lab and this specific project we're uh, engaged in with WIN is to address some of those limitations, uh, specifically around understanding and managing the spatial variability of soils on farm. So one of the first problems with implementing precision agriculture or precision management of soil resources is that often we're making decisions based off of inadequate uh, data or data that is not of a sufficiently high spatial resolution to utilize uh, the useful precision agricultural tools such as variable rate applications or precision management zones. Um, and this comes down to the fact that we don't often have good soils data for every farm we're working on. So the slide we're showing here shows that problem uh, really nicely. The map is actually a colorized to the, the texture of the soil, specifically the clay content. So this relates to things like the nutrient holding capacity or the water retention capacity of the soil. Um, and the background map data is coming from the USDA soil survey. So this is the soil data that's widely available for every uh, farm in Indiana. Um, and what you'll notice is that that data is actually a very coarse 
uh, spatial resolution is only showing main, two main colors or two main textures, red and blue. So you've got high clay soils and low clay soils uh, mapped in this field. Uh, but one of the challenges is that those maps really don't represent the true scope of soil variability within fields. So each of the points that are, are denoted on the map are actually places where we measured the texture of the soil. We actually measured the clay content. And what you'll notice is that there's a tremendous amount of variability that is not represented in the soil map. So we know that the soils we're trying to manage are often more variable than the data we're using to characterize them. So any precision management protocol that utilizes soil spatial information uh, would be inadequately calibrated given the lack of, of detail in our soil data. So the first problem um, limiting the application of precision agriculture really is a data limitation. We don't have good enough soils data or soils data of high enough resolution to meet the needs of precision ag software or management tools. The second problem in precision agriculture is often a lack of expertise among practitioners on how to utilize uh, precision ag technologies. So the graph here is showing um, a survey done by Bruce Erickson at, at Purdue on precision ag dealers relating to what their sort of limitations for implementing uh, precision ag technologies in their business. Um, and I just want to draw your attention to the light blue line here. Um, which is uh, in 2017, they're the highest response in terms of uh, the restrictions of, of respondents on their implementation of precision agriculture. Um, and that relates back to finding employees who can deliver precision agriculture services. So dealers are finding that they can't find employees with the appropriate skill set to actually use precision agriculture tools, and that's limiting their adoption or their delivery of precision ag services to their clientele. So we have a data limitation. We don't have good enough soils data, but we also have a human limitation, which is we lack uh, the training or the expertise amongst people on how to use precision ag tools. So digital soil mapping is a technique that's been developed over the last decade that utilizes soils data in conjunction with environmental covariates or environmental data uh, to develop models that generate higher resolution spatial maps or spatial predictions of soil properties. And this provides a really great opportunity in the precision ag space because precision ag is all about managing large data sets or large sets of environmental data. Most precision ag practitioners have a high level of, of data at their fingertips, including yield monitor data, uh, UAV data, satellite imagery that they can all integrate into a digital soil mapping framework to generate higher resolution soil maps. So the data is there. What we're missing are the tools and the expertise amongst practitioners to utilize those data. So we can take existing data sets that are already there in the hands of most precision ag practitioners and help use them to generate better soil maps to have higher resolution inputs to precision ag products. So our specific project is broken down into two main objectives. The first is a, a, a basic research question around digital soil mapping, and that's to develop uh, tools that reduce the cost of digital soil mapping, utilizing those existing data sets, including legacy uh, agronomic soil fertility testing, as well as precision agriculture data related to yield mapping and yield monitoring efforts. The second objective uh, is a more extension oriented objective, and that's to increase the use of digital soil mapping in precision agriculture, utilizing uh, targeted training, uh, focusing on agricultural practitioners in the precision ag space and developing uh, easy to use precision ag tools that translate the research uh, gleaned in objective one into usable and useful tools for precision ag professionals. So one approach that our lab has addressed in this project is to develop tools to disaggregate existing soil map data. Uh, disaggregation is essentially taking existing soil maps, so the existing USDA soil data, and breaking it into a finer resolution product that better represents the spatial variability of soils. So our first uh, year one goal in this objective was to develop a modeling framework 
that allows us to leverage that legacy soil data to do disaggregation. Essentially what we're doing is we're matching agronomy soil testing data to the specific soil types mapped in a field and then reassigning the location of those soil types based on agronomic uh, testing data. So it's leveraging data that farmers already have, including their soil testing data and the existing soil maps to generate a higher resolution uh, value added soil data product. So the first year we've developed the modeling framework that enables this procedure. Um, in year two, uh, starting this summer, we're actually field testing this disaggregation method at uh, acre and DPAC field sites. Our second research objective is to utilize a new or emerging data product, which is a LIDAR system for measuring surface elevation and utilize that for digital soil mapping. So LIDAR essentially measures the elevation of a surface using lasers um, from a airplane. So the aircraft flies over a landscape um, and the lasers actually are used to measure a very accurate uh, readout of the topography within a region. And we can utilize this topographic information to extract data about the relationships between landscapes, soils, and crops. So in the first year of this project, we've worked on developing tools to modify the LIDAR-based the LIDAR terrain analysis and integrate those into the digital soil mapping products we've developed in Objective 1A. Uh, and we've also utilized some of these data to model uh, crop yield and management zones based on the terrain data. So the, the panels on the left are showing an example of what some of this LIDAR processing looks like. We're converting data into slope products and elevation products um, and products that derive or, or show where the wettest part of the landscape is. And we can then utilize that data to model or predict things like corn yield. So the bottom graph is a, is a plot showing the relationship between corn yield measured with a yield monitor on a combine versus the topographic position. And it really relates to the fact that in this particular field, the lower elevation sites tended to stay wetter. So they have a lower topographic position. They stayed wetter later in the season, giving us better corn yields when the crop was water stressed in August and July. So the goal of this project is to relate landscape features, which are easily measured and readily available to soil or agronomic products in the field. So in the second year of the project, we're going to take this same modeling approach um, and integrate the LIDAR digital soil mapping into projects in Benton and Warren County uh, in the wind region to do some on-farm intensive digital soil mapping. And finally, our last objective, uh, which is more the extension facing objective, is to develop a GIS plugin that enables digital soil mapping. Uh, in the first year of the project, we've really just started to get uh, acclimated to developing these sorts of plugins. We have a beta version of the plugin that allows users to load in their yield data and performs a basic terrain analysis like you saw in objective 1B. Um, our goals for the next year are really to take this plugin and refine it um, to adding uh, some functionality to allow for uh, the disaggregation approach we developed in Objective 1A, as well as uh, generate some really rudimentary digital soil maps based off of soil testing data, yield analysis, and uh, LIDAR-based terrain derivatives. So I'm very excited to see this objective move along. Uh, hopefully we'll have some good extension outputs over the next uh, year and a half. Thank you, Dr. Ackerson, for that uh, overview of what you're doing in digital soil mapping. Uh, the first question I had is with regard to that disaggregation of SERGO. Uh, first of all, I've heard that phrase SERGO or the acronym, but I don't know what it means. So maybe you can explain that. And then in your disaggregation, was it like machine learning based or did you use some physics based knowledge about soils? Uh, so that, that's a good question, Dennis. So SERGO is uh, an acronym for the Soil Survey Geographic Database. And it's essentially the spatial, or, spatial and tabular data that's uh, sort of behind all of the soil survey information from the USDA. So if you're familiar with accessing soil maps through Web Soil Survey, 
that is accessing the same database, Sergo, but through uh, the USDA's web portal. Um, so the, the nice thing about Sergo is we can actually download the whole database and use it um, locally on our, our computers, which gives us a lot of flexibility when handling handling that database. So one, one of the challenges with using Sergo data is that when soils are represented in maps, they're represented as, as polygons, and often those polygons can contain multiple unique soil types within a single polygon. So this is one of the biggest limitations with Sergo is that often there's more data contained in the underlying database than is represented in the accompanying spatial uh, data set vis-a-vis -vis the polygon that Sergo uh, stores data in. So when we talk about disaggregation, what we're really talking about is taking those coarse resolution polygons and breaking them up into their constituent components. There's a couple ways of going about disaggregation. The way we've approached it is on a sort of statistically based method where we look at taking soil sample data, the sort of typical data that a farmer would collect, and we compare that data to the known soil types in that region and find which soil would most likely provide that particular soil test value. So for example, the two main features we use in this method are organic matter content and cation exchange capacity. And so for simplicity, we can just think about organic matter content. So what we might do in a typical agronomic setting is sample uh, for soil fertility tests on a a two and a half acre grid. And each one of those points would be a place where we have a measurement of organic matter content. And so we can find all of the soils in that field and, and look at their uh, distribution of potential organic matter content and compare that to the measured organic matter content in the field. And so we would say uh, in a really simple situation with two soils, a high organic matter soil and a low organic matter soil, we could disaggregate the high soil high organic matter soils to locations that have high organic matter test values and low organic matter soils to locations with low organic matter test values. So it's a sort of hybrid approach of a statistical method that's based on some um, soil survey and sampling theory. Okay, cool. I hope that wasn't too technical, Dennis. Well, <laughs> I, think, I think I've got it. And I'm sure some people that are going to watch this later will fully understand it. That's great. Great, great. My next question that is sort of related. Uh, you mentioned that you're going to be using LIDAR, uh, light detecting, detection and ranging, to do some of this digital soil mapping using accurate topography data. So my question is, how accurate is the LIDAR that we have access to in the state of Indiana? The LIDAR we have access to has sort of two aspects we can think about in terms of its accuracy. One is the, the resolution. Yep. or how, how uh, much of an area an individual pixel covers uh, in real-world surface. And the other is how well-resolved vertical changes in that data product are. So the, the data we're using currently is a 5-meter resolution product, but actually the LiDAR is actually more higher resolution than that. So if someone wanted to, they could download LiDAR with a resolution of, I, I believe it's somewhere around 1 meter. The data often are... Um, a little bit, there's almost often too much data in a, in a product with that resolution. So we often uh, resample that to a, a more usable product. In terms of the actual vertical resolution, I'm, um, I might miss, but misspeak here, but we're talking, you know, the accuracy is within centimeters or inches of vertical resolution. Um, the current product is actually being reflown right now. So we're getting a new updated version of it, which will have an even higher a data quality standard. So we, we can resolve uh, changes in, in elevation of on the order of inches, which is, is far greater than we actually need for, for our purposes. Okay, super. And my last question, uh, you mentioned in the sort of the rollout and making digital soil mapping more useful to the commoner like me, that you'll have GIS plugins, geographic information system plugins. So if I'm using a plug-in, will that be like using an app on my phone? Or will I have to have some knowledge of the, the underlying software? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, our goal is to eventually make these as simple to use as possible. Um, unfortunately, I think that 
Our current version won't be as simple to use as an app on your phone where you can simply load it up, but you'll have to um, load it into uh, another software package. So it's sort of a, a middle ground between someone who's a uh, very sophisticated or savvy computer user and someone who um, can load in um, a piece of software on their computer. I would uh, hearken it to be to say like if you can use Microsoft Word, you could probably use the plugin. Okay, yeah, and that seems fair. We're talking about the digital ag realm, and uh, most of us are certainly familiar with using software of lots of different types to mm -hmm. to accomplish various tasks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I, I would I would love it to eventually be something where someone can uh, can manage that on the phone. But I actually think we uh, in my lab lack the technical expertise to make something that slick and user friendly. So there's sort of a um, lack of technical expertise on our part as well. So it's a sort of two-way street yeah. when it comes to making sure everyone's as, as tech-savvy as possible. Yeah, thanks very much for the update, and we're certainly looking forward to the plugins and the insights to come.